Afternoon, everybody. Nice to see you uh, decked out in your green today for St. Patrick's Day, at least many of you. Um, I'm joining in the fun as well. Uh, I do not have anything to uh, say at the top other than uh, thank you for accommodating my schedule and shifting the briefing back a little bit later today. I appreciate that. My schedule has been even a little more aggressive than usual today. So. Um, anything we need to know? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. There you go. Oh, you, is someone going to walk out maybe? No, there's nothing like that. Okay. <laughs> it's not that, I, not that I know of. You're going to walk out. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Is Ben back there? Uh, okay. Uh, Darlene. Thank you. Uh, can you talk about what is the practical effect of Secretary Kerry's determination that ISIL is committing genocide against Christians and Yazidis and others? Well, uh, obviously over the last uh, few weeks, uh, I've received a number of questions uh, about this. I know that my colleagues at the State Department and other uh, national security agencies across the government have been asked about this. What's happening in, the, uh, in Iraq and in Syria uh, is deeply troubling. We do see this extremist organization targeting religious minorities. In their propaganda, they're featuring evidence of trying to wipe out these religious minorities. And the President has talked on a number of occasions about how this is deeply troubling and is an affront to every person of faith. That's why the President has ordered uh, military action uh, against ISIL in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, in some cases, there have been military actions that have been ordered specifically to protect religious minorities. So there certainly is the example of Mount Sinjar, which we've cited here frequently, that there were, uh, there were Yazidis who were trapped on that mountain. ISIL fighters had them cornered. Uh, and those ISIL fighters were vowing to slaughter them. Uh, there was also a, a, a less prominent uh, example of this, but an important one nonetheless, uh, that there, was, uh, there were ISIL fighters that were carrying out a siege uh, in the Iraqi town of Amrli, uh, where there are an estimated 15,000 Turkmen Shia surrounded by ISIL fighters. Uh, and again, the United States uh, took military action to break that siege. Um, so uh, the United States has, uh, on the orders of the Commander-in-Chief, uh, taken steps to try to protect uh, religious minorities in that uh, region of the world uh, from being uh, the victims of violence at the hands of ISIL. And it's not just true of Yazidis and Shia Muslims, it's also true of Christians. Uh, and. Secretary Kerry announced today and uh, what I thought was a powerful speech uh, discussing how um, uh, you know he now uh, uh, has uh, you know judged assessed uh, that ISIL is responsible for genocide uh, in this region of the world in areas under its control uh, particularly as it relates to Yazidi Christian and Shia populations and uh, you know, this designation is significant it reflects the gravity of the situation there, and it's one that continues to attract the attention not just of the United States, uh, but uh, it's also why the United States has been able to build a strong moral case against ISIL and build a substantial international coalition of 66 nations to degrade and ultimately destroy that terrorist organization. Does it change, does the determination change anything on the ground now, today, or tomorrow for any of the people who are being persecuted or feeling persecuted? Well, in terms of um, uh, w what it essentially uh, indicates is that the, um, that the United States will cooperate with uh, independent efforts uh, to investigate uh, genocide. Uh, there obviously is um, you know, evidence that's been collected and, um, and we'll make sure that that evidence is preserved and we'll assist in the effort uh, of collecting and analyzing additional evidence of atrocities uh, to support that, uh, that investigation. But that's, that's the next step in the process and the United States uh, will be supportive of it. Some groups want the administration to do more militarily to fight uh, ISIL. Do you foresee that happening at some point? 
as a result? Well, uh, the, the President's going to continue to rely on the good advice of his uh, military commanders. Uh, some of that will obviously be uh, related to the kind of military contributions that uh, other countries who are part of our coalition make to this effort. Um, the amount of military involvement in this region of the world has already been significant. More than 10,000 airstrikes have been carried out against ISIL targets. Uh, about 40 percent of the property territory that ISIL uh, controlled in Iraq uh, is an area that is no longer under their control. Uh, the percentage is somewhat smaller in Syria. Uh, I think it's between uh, 10 and 20 percent. Uh, but that's an indication that we have had uh, some success uh, in combining the military might of our coalition with the effectiveness of fighters on the ground fighting for their own country. Uh, that's an important part of our strategy. Uh, there are other elements of our strategy, too, in terms of shutting down the flow of foreign fighters, uh, um, making it harder for ISIL to recruit uh, fighters to their cause, and obviously making it harder for ISIL to finance their efforts. Uh, all of those elements of our strategy have contributed to our success as well. Uh, but when it comes to military action against ISIL, uh, that uh, military action has been uh, robust, it's made a difference, and it's been closely coordinated with fighters on the ground that ultimately uh, need to be responsible for fighting for their own country. The President was having a conference call today on Judge Garland's nomination. Can you talk a little bit about who he was talking to on the call and what the message was that he had for them? Well, the, uh, the White House, leading up to the President making a decision about his Supreme Court nominee, had engaged with a variety of organizations, uh, not just uh, around town but across the country. And uh, this was an opportunity for uh, those uh, organizations and their members to hear directly from the President about why he made this choice. Uh, and I think the President uh, obviously spent some time discussing how proud he is uh, of the choice that he's made, how committed he is to the constitutional responsibility that he has uh, to make this choice, uh, and how committed he uh, is to making the case to Congress that they should fulfill their constitutional duty as well. Um, so I, I, um, I didn't listen in on the call, but uh, I would be surprised if there was anything that the President said on the call that uh, would have surprised you. Would you know if he asked them to do anything specific in this two-week period that's coming up where the Senate is on recess and members are going back home to their districts and you're, you all are hoping that they'll hear a lot of pushback from their constituents on this? Well, I, I don't know that the President had any specific asks. Uh, we'll look into that. but. Uh, you know, I think the President sent a pretty clear signal, though, that this is a, a high priority of his, um, and he hoped that this would be a priority that people all across the country would share. Uh, finally, just one more on this. There's been some speculation that there is some sort of a deal that Republicans signal to the White House that if the President nominated Garland, he would be confirmed, they would confirm him in a lame duck session if Hillary Clinton wins the election. Is there any sort of deal or agreement along those lines? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, the, the truth is, we do not think that there is any good reason that anybody in the Senate can articulate for waiting until the lame duck to confirm a consensus nominee to the Supreme Court. There's no excuse. The only excuse we occasionally hear from Republicans is that uh, politics is getting in the way. Well, I think my message to them is don't let politics get in the way of doing, in, of doing your job. I don't think the American people are particularly understanding or sympathetic to Republicans that they won't do their job because it's an election year. In fact, in election years, that's actually when we, pay, when we have a tendency to pay the most attention to whether or not our elected representatives uh, at the federal or state level are doing their jobs. Uh, and right now, Republicans are, are promising not to do their job, uh, even though the President has given them uh, a golden opportunity to rise above politics. The President has put forward a nominee that Republicans themselves say would do a good job on the court. Senator Hatch described Chief Judge Garland as uh, a consensus nominee. Uh, that's why it shouldn't be particularly difficult for Republicans to put politics aside, put their constitutional duty first, uh, and take, um, follow the uh, the long-followed steps uh, of confirming the President's Supreme Court nominee in a timely fashion. Okay. Yes. 
Does the White House have a strategy to uh, soften Senator McConnell's resolve on not holding any votes and not having any hearings? Well, we're certainly going to continue to make a forceful, principled case that that's what he should do. Uh, fortunately, the uh, White House is not in a position of speaking alone on this matter. Uh, we've obviously been uh, quite pleased with uh, the response among Democrats in the United States Senate uh, to the President's decision to nominate Chief Judge Garland. Uh, I think it is evidence that um, Senator Hatch was right when he described Chief Judge Garland as a consensus nominee, because we see so many Democrats out there saying that he was a good pick. What may be surprising to some uh, is that there are plenty of conservatives who have had positive things to say about the President's uh, nominee. Uh, I, I can give you a couple of examples. I just happen to have them right here. Um, uh, Judge uh, Ken Starr, who is a Solicitor General, represented the United States of America before the Supreme Court, somebody who knows a little something about the law, uh, described Chief Judge Garland as uh, superbly qualified to serve on our nation's uh, highest court. Uh, we discussed uh, the op-ed that uh, President George W. Bush's Attorney General, Alberto Gonzalez, wrote uh, indicating uh, that Chief Judge Garland deserves a vote uh, and urging the Senate uh, to follow through on that. Uh, so I can understand if uh, Leader McConnell uh, may not be particularly sympathetic to my point of view, but maybe somebody that has the uh, legal and legal expertise and the intellectual weight uh, of somebody like uh, Judge Starr uh, or Attorney General Gonzalez, uh, maybe they can prevail upon uh, Leader McConnell uh, to put uh, the interests of the United States and the functioning of our uh, justice system ahead of his uh, more parochial political concerns. Does the White House see any cracks within the Senate Republicans? Uh, there's been some reports about Senator Grassley being uh, maybe willing to see Judge Garland in the next couple weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Judge Garland did have an opportunity to, um, uh, to talk with uh, uh, Chairman Grassley yesterday on the telephone. Uh, as is also customary, uh, White House staff uh, had been in touch with um, a number of offices on Capitol Hill to begin arranging meetings for uh, Chief Judge Garland. Uh, as is customary, they contacted leadership offices as well as members of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, and in those staff-level conversations, Senator Grassley's staff indicated to the White House uh, that they'd be prepared to schedule a meeting uh, after the uh, two-week uh, recess that, uh, that the Senate will be getting at the end of this week. Uh, that obviously is uh, something we believe is entirely appropriate. It certainly is, uh, uh, I think, the most basic expectation that um, people would have a for a Senate Judiciary Committee chairman when a uh, consensus a Supreme Court uh, nominee has been put forward. Um, and uh, so we're hopeful that, um, that that's something that will be scheduled. I, I think the one thing, uh, you know, Senator Grassley uh, previously today indicated that he sort of mused out loud about whether or not somebody was listening in on uh, his phone call with uh, Chief Judge Garland. I can assure you that of. Uh, that, of course, is not true. Um, it was a one-on-one -on -one phone call. Um, but, you know, I would hope that despite our political differences that uh, uh, the Chairman Grassley will fulfill his responsibility and be able to work with the White House to at least begin the process of uh, scheduling a meeting with, uh, with Chief Judge Garland. How does the President uh, plan to stay involved in next week in that, during a very historic <laughs> trip? Yeah. Well, uh, the President will continue to be uh, uh, engaged in this process. And, uh, you know, I'll have a little bit more uh, detail about the President's schedule uh, in Latin America to discuss tomorrow. Uh, but there will be uh, one or two opportunities over the course of uh, the, the five-day trip for the President to take questions from all of you. Um, so to the extent that all of you may continue to be interested in this story, maybe you'll have some questions for the President. Uh, and I'm sure the President will uh, be happy to, uh, to answer them, even if uh, those answers need to also be subsequently translated into Spanish. So, okay. Uh, let's move around. Andrew. Um, just going back to your point on genocide. Um,
talked about independent investigations. Are you talking, can you be a bit more specific? Are you talking about the ICC or what are you doing? Well, I, the ICC typically is, uh, uh, is the uh, organization that would take a look at this. And, uh, you know, given the, uh, uh, the judgment that, uh, that Secretary Kerry has made, uh, the United States would be um, supportive of that, of that effort, both uh, rhetorically, but also uh, uh, in a tangible way as well. Uh, the United States will support efforts to collect, document, preserve, and analyze evidence of atrocities. Um, and the United States will uh, do all we can to ensure that perpetrators of these atrocities are held to account and brought to justice. Okay, thanks. And a question about Yemen. Um, Saudi airstrike has killed 119 people in a market. Um, can you categorically say that U.S. targeting or refueling assets were involved in this? Well, for an operational question like this, uh, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. Um, we have expressed uh, our concerns about the loss of innocent life uh, in Yemen. Um, the violence there that is plaguing that country uh, has caught too many innocent civilians in the crossfire. And uh, it is why um, we would welcome and do welcome the statement from coalition uh, spokesperson um, uh, Saudi General uh, Ahmed al Asiri, uh, who indicated today that major operations in Yemen are coming to an end and that the coalition will work on, quote, long term plans, unquote, to bring stability to the country. Um, we have long made the case that Yemen is in dire need of a political solution, and it, that political solution needs to come as soon as possible. Uh, and that's why we've continued to urge all parties uh, to return to uh, UN facilitated peace talks so that we can build upon the uh, positive, uh, positive conversations that occurred uh, back in December. Uh, we need to find a way, um, a way forward for those conversations to um, bring, a, bring the fighting in Yemen to an end. Uh, and we're going to continue to be supportive of that process and continue to urge all parties to uh, participate constructively in it. Um, I take what you say about the, the coalition statement, uh, but the Saudis have, have um, offered to wind down or said they're going to wind down this conflict before and then haven't really followed through. Do you have any assurances that <coughs> this time it's, uh, the war really is coming to an end or something? Well, well, we're obviously going to continue to monitor the situation uh, there. There are some initial reports of de-escalation along the Saudi-Yemen uh, border. Um, and we're also uh, pleased to see coalition uh, indications that they're working on efforts to deliver critically needed humanitarian assistance to a number of Yemeni villages along the Saudi-Yemen border. So these are preliminary indications. I would uh, readily acknowledge that, Andrew. But uh, you know, we're going to continue to encourage uh, all sides to engage in the kind of uh, diplomatic conversations that could bring the fighting in that war-torn country to an end. Okay. Ron. On the genocide issue, it sounds like nothing really is going to change on the ground in terms of the strategy that, uh, because I, as I've heard from the State Department as well, it's the U.S. position that you've been executing this, this, this war, this conflict, whatever it is, um, as if it were a genocide anyway. This is just a formal declaration, so nothing really changes on it. It's not like you, have to, you don't feel like you have to escalate anything to, to now deal with a genocide. Well, uh, Ron, quite frankly, the, we have been aware for some time of ISIL targeting religious minorities, and we've taken uh, action uh, significant actions to try to prevent it. Uh, and that includes uh, efforts by ISIL fighters to target Christians just because of their religion. Um, so uh, I'm not at all suggesting that, uh, a, uh, that this judgment that the, that's been reached by the State Department is somehow um, uh, unimportant. It is significant anytime you're talking about uh, applying this label. Um, but what's also true is that Robust action has already been taken by the United States and our coalition partners to try to protect the religious minorities that we already know are being targeted by ISIL. Um, 
Um, the uh, reporting on the Austin fundraiser, it sounds like the president did endorse uh, Secretary Clinton or said essentially that the race is going to come to an end soon. Sanders is not going, is not sustainable. Is that a turning point? Is that, is that what he in fact said? Uh, no, it's not what he in fact well, said. What did he say? Well, I, the, I, I'm not, I was there for the fundraiser and I was there for the, the part where this conversation uh, occurred. Uh, what I'll just say in general uh, is that President Obama made uh, a case that would be familiar to all of you, which is that as Democrats move through this competitive primary process, we need to be mindful of the fact that our success uh, in November in electing a Democratic president will depend on the commitment and ability of the Democratic Party to come together behind our nominee. Uh, and uh, the President did not indicate um, or uh, specify a preference in the race. In fact, the President uh, pointed out uh, something that he's pointed out to all of you, uh, which is that both of the Democrats who are running, because they have demonstrated an understanding and a commitment to building on the progress that we've made thus far, would be far better presidents than anybody that's been put up on the Republican side. So nothing's changed. He's still neutral, can't make up his mind. Um, well, no, no, no. I, did, I, did, taking, taking I did not say that he couldn't make up his mind. The president's cast a ballot. Uh, the right. president has voted in the Illinois Democratic primary. How do you vote for? Um, we have not indicated the, that preference. Um, but what we have um, what we have said and what the president has said both publicly and privately uh, is that he will have an important responsibility uh, in the summer and fall once the nomination process has concluded uh, in bringing the party together uh, and making sure that even after a vigorous debate, which the President, by the way, believes is really good for the party. It was really good for the party in 2008, uh, and uh, this kind of competition uh, is good for sharpening the skills of the candidates uh, and exercising the organizational muscle of the Democratic Party. Uh, but once this process comes to a conclusion, uh, everybody in the Democratic Party uh, will uh, understand the stakes of the debate, uh, and given uh, those stakes, uh, we'll need to unify behind the Democratic Party nominee to ensure uh, that he or she uh, can win in November. Uh, Flint, the hearings on the Hill, does the EPA administrator still have the full confidence of the President? Uh, absolutely. And I think that you have seen the uh, EPA, uh, at the direction of Administrator McCarthy, take aggressive action to ensure the health well-being and safety of citizens in Flint, but also citizens in communities all across the country. That, that uh, EPA continues to be deeply involved in testing the water supply there and offering scientific and technical expertise and advice to local officials as they try to rectify the problems there. About now, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> because it was a long period in. where uh, I think your explanation was that the EPA couldn't do anything. It was the responsibility of the state authorities to act first. Is that correct? Am I correct? Well, well, yeah, but you just asked me whether or not we have confidence in the, admi uh, the, uh, the leadership of the administrator of the EPA. And I'm describing to you all of the steps that have been taken to safeguard uh, the water supply, uh, not just in Flint, but in communities all across the country. The EPA administrator sent a letter to governors coast to coast saying that they need to clarify exactly how they are implementing the lead and copper rule uh, to make sure that nothing has fallen through the cracks. Uh, and that if there is some inattention to these important rules and, and enforcing them, uh, that the EPA will be prepared to act to plug those gaps, to make sure that we can protect the water supply of communities across the country. She understands how serious this is. And uh, the truth is, if you, when you take a look at the uh, record that she has compiled uh, just in her few years as the administrator of the EPA, uh, there's a strong case to make that the United States of America has never had a better uh, administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency than Gina McCarthy. What's the administration's position on the governor? There have been calls for him to resign. Well, uh, what we have indicated is that obviously the, uh, the 
citizens and voters of the state of Michigan are going to have to decide who they want to lead their state. Uh, and, you know, frankly, this is another example of where we can't let our <coughs> partisan differences with Governor Snyder interfere with our ability to respond to an urgent situation uh, in a community of about 100,000 people in Michigan. Uh, and that's why you've seen the federal government mobilize significant resources from FEMA to provide uh, water filters and uh, to distribute bottled water. It's why you've seen the HHS announce significant grant funding to enhance uh, uh, health care uh, and medical assistance in this community. Uh, you've also seen uh, commitments to expand uh, educational opportunities, Head Start centers uh, in that community who's dealing with uh, this crisis. Uh, and we've We've done all that despite the fact that the governor from the state of Michigan uh, represents a, a different political party. This is too important for politics. So, so overall, the president satisfied with the response to date? Well, I think overall the president recognizes uh, that what happened in Flint was a tragedy. Uh, and this is something that is going to have uh, long-term consequences for the health and well-being of many, many families there. And it is incumbent upon um, state, local, and federal officials to mobilize necessary resources to try to uh, meet these needs uh, and fix what was so badly broken. Uh, and that includes needing uh, additional action from Congress to appropriate the necessary resources uh, so that uh, the, some of the significant infrastructure flaws can be addressed as well. Okay. Let's move around. Atsushi, how are you? Good, good, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me ask about Asia, uh, first of all, and then North Korea. Uh, President signed executive order yesterday to put a fresh, san fresh sanction against North Korea, you know, company and individual, including mining corporation and banking corporation. And in terms of the implementation, implementation of the sanction, uh, as we all know, the coordination with China is essential. So my question is, uh, the United States government, the administration has already launched a consultation with China in, in terms of the implementation of the sanction. Uh, that's a good question. We, we have talked uh, since we saw the North Korean nuclear test and the subsequent test of uh, ballistic missile technology there. We've acknowledged that uh, our success in applying additional pressure on the North Korean government would depend upon the effective cooperation of Chinese authorities. Uh, the reason for that uh, is that China has uh, a rather unique relationship with North Korea. Uh, the North Korean economy is more dependent on the Chinese economy than any other. Uh, the relations between um, uh, the North Korean government and the Chinese government uh, are um, more integrated than North Korea's government-to-government -government relationship with any other country in the world. Uh, and mobilizing an effective international response would require uh, effective cooperation with Chinese officials. And that's what we have succeeded in obtaining. Uh, and that is why we have been able to uh, put in place sanctions against North Korea that go far beyond sanctions that we put in place against Korea North Korea in the past. Uh, so this will apply additional pressure, not just to the North Korean government, but also to the ruling elite in North Korea. Um, many members of the ruling elite uh, enjoy uh, rather luxurious lifestyles. That stands in quite stark contrast to the uh, suffering of the vast majority of the North Korean uh, population. And that is a direct result of policy immoral policy decisions that are made by the North Korean government. And you know, we have looked for ways that we could apply sanctions to maximize the impact they would have uh, on the North Korean uh, ruling elite. That is, after all, making the kinds of decisions that are uh, destabilizing the broader region. I believe that the uh, U.S. unilateral sanction, which has, you know, the President has signed last month, required uh, president uh, investigate uh, any person, I mean the entity, any individual, if uh, there is a suspect, uh, the suspicion, you know, uh, suspect to have a transaction, illicit transaction with North Korea. So it is fair to say uh, if any person would have 
illicit transaction with these uh, entity and individual, which uh, has been design designated yesterday, and these entity would also be punished, including in chi Chinese company or Chinese in, in, uh, financial institution. It is fair to say the third party would be also punished. Well, uh, you're asking me a very technical question. It's an entirely legitimate one. Uh, but my colleagues at the Treasury Department can help you understand exactly uh, what sort of penalties are associated with violating these sanctions. Uh, but I, I think the, the basic crux of your question is one that I can uh, affirmatively answer, which is that the successful implementation of these sanctions will require the United States, China, and other countries in the region to coordinate effectively to enforce them. Uh, and how exactly they're enforced and what sort of penalties are associated with violating these sanctions uh, are questions that my colleagues at the Treasury Department can answer. Last one. You know, okay. uh, I believe that uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping would visit uh, this town later this month uh, for a nuclear security summit. Um, that president will meet in person with President Xi Jinping and I believe, you know, if they meet, uh, President Obama will raise concern on uh, South China Sea issue. And does uh, President Obama, how the President Obama raise concern, you know, uh, do you think, you know, the United States has to take another fresh action against these issues? Uh, the North, the, the Nuclear Security Summit uh, will convene here in Washington, D.C. at the end of this month. Uh, we do anticipate that a number of world leaders will travel to the United States to continue uh, working on this uh, priority that President Obama identified early in, early in his first term. Uh, I don't have specific confirmation yet about who will be attending the summit, um, but uh, as we um, have more information about that, we'll let you know. Uh, I suspect that that means the President will spend some time meeting with uh, some of the world leaders who are here. Uh, but we'll keep you posted on uh, when those meetings get set up. Okay. okay. Colleen. Thanks, Josh. Um, I want to ask you about reports that Cuba is going to return for dissidents to the U.S. Um, did the White House know that this was happening, and was this a requirement ahead of the President visiting Cuba? Uh, Colleen, the, the, the United States has uh, been advocating with the Cubans for quite some time uh, the uh, release of political prisoners uh, inside of Cuba. Um, so obviously, if the reports are true, I'm not in a position to confirm them. If they are true, uh, that obviously would be a step that we would welcome. Uh, but um, I don't have any information about uh, where those individuals uh, might travel, if anywhere, outside of Cuba. Was this necessary to happen before the President goes to Cuba? Well, we have been, both before the, the trip to Cuba was announced uh, and after, have been continuing to urge uh, the Cuban government to more effectively respect and protect the universal hu human rights of their citizens. That includes uh, freeing from prison uh, those who are jailed for no other reason than their political views. Um, and one, on one other subject, um, Gallup showed last week that President Obama had a 50 percent approval rating, which was his highest in almost three years. And I'm curious what you attribute that to. Why do you think his approval ratings are going up at this time? Well, it certainly is possible that, uh, in comparison to some of the Republican candidates, that President Obama starts to look pretty good. Um, I might be biased in making that judgment, but uh, it's possible that that individual poll might uh, be some evidence of that. Um, but look, I, the, setting aside the, the poll numbers, they're going to go up and they're going to go down. Uh, the President's uh, – a large portion of the President's success in office has been predicated on his ability to not try to tailor his individual actions or statements based on day-to-day -day movements in the polls. Uh, many of the most significant successes that we have had uh, have relied upon President Obama's ability, oh, President Obama's ability uh, to look beyond just one day's movement in the polls or one 24-hour news cycle, uh, but rather to chart a longer course uh, by setting long-term goals uh, and uh, ensuring that uh, our eyes are fixed upon uh, those goals over the horizon. Uh, and that is, um, that is what allowed us to do things like 
complete uh, an international agreement to prevent, or prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon or secure an international climate agreement that uh, resulted in nearly 200 countries making a commitment to reduce their carbon pollution. Uh, but there are even domestic things, too, that would fit this category. The President took uh, — made some uh, significant and politically unpopular decisions very earlier in his — early in his presidency uh, to rescue the auto industry. Uh, and because of those policies, um, uh, American workers and auto companies and entrepreneurs and in innovators uh, were given an opportunity to lead a resurrection uh, of the American auto industry. And we now see, uh, seven years later, that the American auto industry uh, is stronger than ever. They are selling more cars. Um, they are producing and selling more cars than ever. And um, Again, if we had just been focused on uh, what was the politically popular decision uh, back in February and March of 2009, um, the President would not have s thrown uh, the American auto industry the kind of lifeline that they uh, needed. And as a result of that decision, again, which was politically unpopular at the time, uh, you know, that laid the groundwork for a dramatic resurgence uh, in uh, not just the American auto industry, but the American manufacturing sector as a whole. Okay. Stephanie. Does the White House believe that the, or the President rather, believe that the longer Bernie Sanders stays in the race, the more likely Hillary Clinton would have trouble defeating the GOP nominee? Uh, no. Uh, the, I've drawn this uh, parallel uh, on a couple of occasions, and I think it is uh, appropriate. In 2008, there were many people who were concerned uh, on the Democratic side that the primary contest between then-Senator Obama and then-Senator Clinton was going to last much longer than most people expected. And many Democrats were concerned about the potential impact that this could have on the ability of Democrats to win the general election uh, in November 2008. Uh, instead, what we saw is that both candidates uh, steadily improved their performance in the debates uh, and on uh, the campaign trail and in their stump speeches. Uh, and what we also saw is we saw that both campaigns were also able to hone their organizational skills. Uh, both campaigns were challenged to build political operations uh, in states that uh, Democrats had not traditionally com uh, competed for. Uh, the best example I have of this is that uh, there was a competitive Democratic primary in Indiana in May of 2008. And a lot of Democrats were thinking, we're in really bad shape if we're still fighting in May of 2008. Uh, especially if we're fighting over Democratic votes in Indiana. But what that actually allowed both campaigns to do was to build really strong political organizations in that state. And uh, what that resulted in? It resulted in a strong Democratic political organization that was in place for the general election in 2008. Uh, and the Democratic candidate for President, Barack Obama, won the state of Indiana uh, uh, for the first time in, uh, uh, in quite some time. Uh, that was an important victory, and I think it is a, the clearest example of how a longer than expected primary contest can actually make uh, a candidate and a, and a party organization uh, much stronger than anticipated. One more. Does the President think, has he made, has he mentioned anything about the Adam LaRoche uh, story, uh, one of his favorite teams, uh, they came to him and told him, son's kind of hanging out a little bit too much in the, in the clubhouse. Apparently. Has he made any mention of that? Uh, I, uh, I haven't talked to him about that story. I had a chance to, uh, uh, to read it a little bit earlier today. Um, yeah, I, I noted that Mr. LaRoche said that, uh, that his decision to retire was unrelated to uh, that request from the general manager. Uh, but, um, um, you know, but obviously, I think, uh, if nothing else, uh, it says something uh, pretty powerful about the relationship between Mr. LaRoche and his son. And as, uh, as a relatively new father myself with the son, uh, I hope that uh, I can build a similarly strong relationship like that. Okay. Michelle. Hey, Josh, um, we heard Senator Reid today saying that some Republicans being willing now to meet with um, nominee Garland um, is, are, are caving, that there are cracks showing, um, that it's a breakthrough even. I mean, would you go so far as to say that that seems like that big of a deal that they're just willing to meet with him at this point? Well, I, I think the observation that I would make is, you know, as recently as a week or so ago, uh, m the vast majority, if not all, senators were saying that they would uh, 
not meet, not even meet with the President's nominee and would never consider a vote on the President's nominee. Uh, after the President's uh, 11 o'clock announcement yesterday, uh, before I could even get my lunch, we had Republicans out there saying that they were ready to meet with him and could imagine voting for him in the lame duck session. So that's clearly not nearly as far as the Constitution suggests they should go in giving fair consideration to the President's nominee. But I do think it represents tangible movement in a positive direction from the previously unreasonable obstructionist position that Republicans had adopted. Do you think some of that might be, though, if, if they still say that the end game is to meet with Garland to let him know that they don't think now is the right time to do this, um, that it's maybe just to save face for the time being or to appear that they're giving him at least some I don't know, gentlemanly consideration if they're not considering him ultimately for the position? Well, it, it, these individual senators are going to have to ultimately make up their mind uh, about whether or not they are willing to fulfill their constitutional duty or if they're just going to use politics as an excuse to not do their job. That's the, that's the simple question. Uh, and we'll have a pretty clear way to evaluate this uh, because the Senate does uh, at least some of their most important work in public. We'll have a way to tell. Uh, are they holding hearings? Uh, is the committee taking a vote? Is the floor of the United States Senate uh, the, the venue uh, for every member of the United States Senate to, to weigh in or not? And we'll be able to judge. Yesterday, you seemed pretty reluctant to, I mean, you weren't asked to place odds on it, but you didn't seem to want to go so far as to say you think that this will ultimately happen, that he will ultimately be confirmed. Um, but the chief of staff today on CNN made it pretty clear that he, he felt that is exactly what would happen. So is that just a difference of opinion within the White House, or is there kind of a shift now towards more confidence that this is actually going to make it all the way through? Well, I, um, of course the White House is confident. We certainly are confident that uh, the nominee that we have put forward merits uh, consideration by the United States Senate. The good news is there are a lot of Republicans who agree with us, including Republicans who still serve in the Senate, including seven Republicans in the Senate who voted for him the last time that he was up for confirmation. So we are confident that he is somebody who deserves uh, fair consideration. And look, if they do, he absolutely will be confirmed uh, to a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Uh, so that is why I think that you see a lot of confidence uh, from the White House uh, in, uh, in the path that we have uh, laid out here. So you also have confidence that he will actually be confirmed? I do have confidence. I mean, I, I'm not going to stand up here and make predictions about sort of what the percentage is. Uh, but there's no doubt that he uh, deserves uh, fair consideration. And if given fair consideration, uh, he will be confirmed. Uh, and uh, I'm confident in that. Okay. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, all right, that's fine. Okay. Um, on the call today with progressives, the, the people on the call were urged to get involved um, and to make their voices heard. So what, what does that really mean? What, what does the White House want these people to be physically doing as this evolves? <coughs> well, I, I think the President has a lot of passion for this issue. And I think that was uh, on display in the Rose Garden yesterday. And uh, I think that was evident in the message that he uh, delivered on the conference call today. And the President is hoping that people across the country who share his passion, uh, who believe that the, uh, an appointment to the Supreme Court should transcend politics, uh, that the Senate should fulfill its constitutional duty, uh, and if people share the President's passion uh, on this issue, uh, then they should make their voices heard. And they can do that in a variety of ways. Uh, and you know, uh, you know, that's what we'll obviously... Uh, what does the White House feel would be effective? So it, you state your case every single day. Mm -hmm. So there could be millions of Americans out there who feel the same way. What do you want those people to be doing? Mm -hmm. Well, we obviously uh, believe that um, you know, that people should be engaged in the process. They should sort of understand exactly what the stakes are. And if they feel strongly about it in the same way that the President does, they should uh, make their voices heard in public. Uh, we would strongly support that. And if that means uh, contacting their member of Congress or um, you know, contacting uh, an organization uh, that is interested um, in this issue, then uh, again, we would uh, encourage them to, to be engaged in the process. So you want people out there to be calling these Republican senators? Well, that certainly is one option that is available to people. Uh, but ultimately, you know, people are going to have to decide for themselves 
uh, what they uh, uh, what they want to do to make their voices heard. Thanks. Okay, Mark. Yeah, Josh, I'm going to come back to Cuba. Uh, sure. Speaker Ryan uh, spoke out about the president's trip today, and specifically about some of the steps that have been taken in the last few weeks to, uh, you know, ease travel and trade restrictions and such. He said, perhaps the president needs reminding that this is a major <coughs> human rights abuser that he's going to visit, and specifically that these deals are going to further legitimize and even benefit the Cuban government. What do you put your response to that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think my response to that is just simply that the policy that uh, Speaker Ryan ostensibly supports uh, that was in place before President Obama uh, announced a change in this policy was a policy that failed. Uh, that policy had been in place for more than five decades and had not brought about any of the kinds of changes that we would like to see on the uh, island of Cuba. Uh, the President has decided it's time for a different approach, uh, and it's time for an approach that involves greater engagement uh, between the United States and Cuba both on a uh, uh, people-to-people <coughs> level, uh, but also on a level, on an economic level. Uh, and that, that greater engagement, uh, which is, by the way, strongly supported by an overwhelming majority of Cuban citizens, uh, is one that we believe uh, will eventually lead to the kinds of changes in Cuba that we would like to see. More importantly, it will lead to the kinds of changes that the Cuban people would like to see. And that's why uh, we've implemented uh, these changes. I can also uh, ask about the meeting with the dissidents that's part of the President's uh, itinerary. Yeah. Uh, I know you've said that you'll be able to choose who comes to it. That's right. Does that specifically mean that the White House had a list of people it invited and every single person on that list will be able to come to that meeting? Well, it, what it means is it means that we will be the ones that do the inviting. Uh, and it means that the United States will not be checking with the Cuban government in advance to determine if they're okay with us inviting that individual to participate in the meeting. Uh, we'll be issuing the invites, uh, and the President will be making the decision about uh, with whom he meets, and that will be done without any, in, without any interference uh, by the Cuban government. And we will, uh, uh, as the meeting gets closer, be able to talk to you about who exactly will participate. Okay. Does that mean that you have assurances from the Cuban government that whoever you invite can come? Well, uh, we're not talking to the Cuban government about our list. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to make the invites based on who we believe uh, the President should interact with. Uh, and the President's looking forward to this opportunity. It's, I think it sends a pretty strong signal about the commitment uh, and priority that he has placed on a respect for uh, basic human rights, including people who uh, have different political views than the government. Okay. Ilhan. Thank you. Uh, on Turkey, Josh, you talk about Turkey last week as well. Uh, just today, after you talk about Zaman newspaper, biggest newspaper seized last uh, yeah. week. Today, there's the indictment and the second best selling newspaper's owner now uh, asked for uh, 23 years of jail sentence. My first question, I, I got two questions. My first question is, do you think NATO ally, uh, U.S. friend, uh, is uh, under the President Obama's watch losing its democratic character? Well, let me start by saying that n Turkey is a NATO ally, and the United States takes our obligations to our NATO allies seriously. And uh, the nation of Turkey, uh, in the last several weeks, uh, has been plagued by terrorist activity, including violence perpetrated by terrorists against innocent civilians. And the United States stands with our NATO ally in Turkey uh, as they confront those terrorists. We also stand with them as they assert their right to defend themselves. Uh, and um, we have also found it uh, effective and valuable to our counter-ISIL effort to be able to draw upon the important contributions that Turkey has made. Uh, Turkey has made progress in uh, sealing the border between Turkey and Syria. That has had a tangible impact on the ability of ISIL to move foreign fighters from around the world to Syria. Um, th so that's a positive thing. Uh, we have also secured agreement from Turkey to allow the United States and coalition aircraft to use military facilities and air bases inside of Turkey to more efficiently and more effectively carry out military operations against ISIL targets uh, in Syria. 
all of that is positive and uh, important. At the same time, uh, the United States continues to be troubled uh, by the Turkish government's use of appointed trustees uh, to shut down or interfere with the, edu with the editorial operations of media outlets that are sometimes critical of the government. Court-ordered supervision of a media company's finances and operations should not prompt changes to the newsroom or to a news organization's editorial policies. We call on the Turkish government to ensure full respect for due process and equal treatment under the law. And in a democratic society, uh, critical opinions should be encouraged, not silenced. So we urge Turkish authorities to ensure their actions uphold the universal democratic values enshrined in Turkey's constitution, including freedom of the speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom of the press. Uh, one more, you just talk about freedom of speech. Uh, there is a petition signed by 1,100 academics in Turkey, including some of the U.S. citizens from the uh, uh, U.S. as well. And now hundreds of these academics uh, are under trial. Some of them got fired, suspended. Uh, 700 or 600 of them under investigations, just because they signed the letter. Uh, so my question is, uh, since President Erdogan scheduled to come to Washington, D.C., I think it's not confirmed. If he comes, or in Ankara, do you think the U.S. needs to raise these human rights issues with the Ankara more forcefully, uh, considering we know that President Obama did not raise these issues in recent meetings in uh, Antalya or Paris? Well, Ilhan, let me just say uh, generally uh, that the Obama administration has followed uh, in the footsteps of previous administrations here in the United States of advocating for universal human rights around the world. And President Obama routinely, in his meetings with leaders around the world, continues to impress upon those leaders how much of a priority we place on respecting basic universal human rights, including freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and freedom of assembly. These are priorities for the United States, both in terms of them being closely held values here at home, but also in terms of the way that we advocate for those values around the world. Uh, so. Uh, in our conversations across the government with uh, our Turkish counterparts, it is not at all uncommon for us to continue to advocate for those values and continue to urge the Turkish government to do a better job of respecting uh, those basic uh, human rights. Now, we have frequent conversations with the Turkish government uh, because we are able to effectively coordinate with them on a range of issues, particularly issues that are critical to U.S. national security. Uh, and we value that, that, that coordination and our ability to cooperate with the Turks, uh, particularly when it comes to our counter-ISIL uh, cooperation. But that does not in any way lessen our commitment to standing up for the kinds of universal human rights that uh, we believe should be protected, not just here in the United States, uh, but around the world, particularly inside the borders of some of our closest allies. Okay? April. Josh, a couple of questions. Um, I want to go back to Flint and something that Ron had asked you about um, the calls for the governor to step down. Um, is there uh, some kind of unwritten rule or a written rule that you never ask for uh, someone to resign or elected officials to resign? I'm just asking because that's been brought yeah. to you before about other elected officials. Uh, if, there's a, if there's an unwritten rule, no one has ever communicated it to me. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't think I can recall a situation in which I called on somebody to resign from here, but um, I wouldn't rule that out, I guess. I guess it will just depend on, maybe if I wake up on the wrong side of the bed one morning, I'll just be demanding resignation letters everywhere. No, I'm asking because we... But no, I, I don't believe that I've done that uh, I'm this asking point. because we've asked you in the past, and re most recently with Rahm Emanuel, and I just wondered if there was some kind of rule that you guys had here. Now, on that subject, um, Congressman Elijah Cummings is calling for him, uh, the, the governor of Michigan, to step down because of, quote unquote, uh, grave revelations that they found after listening to the governor's testimony. Um, he called him an absentee governor, um, and he saw signs and he ignored them. Um, with that, is there any blame to be laid on the governor of Michigan when it comes to this long, ongoing issue where there is going to be some are saying a lost generation because of this poison that was in the water. 
Well, look, anytime you have a problem that is this significant, that occurs on the watch of uh, state and local officials, accountability is important. And there is an ongoing uh, investigation, I, I believe more than one, uh, to look at uh, exactly what happened and what led to this significant failure. Um, so I've tried to avoid uh, weighing in on uh, aspects of that investigation that could be perceived as uh, interfering with it. Uh, but obviously, uh, accountability is important, particularly when uh, we're talking about the health and well-being of thousands of American citizens. What is the gravity of this whole situation? Where does the blame lie? I mean, even beyond, yes, there's an investigation, but from what we've seen, we've heard people have been sick, people, I mean, there are medical reports that children are going to have problems down the road, long-term effects. Um, you have, you still have the water issue still there. Um, where does the blame lie? Well, April, I guess this is part of what the investigation is looking to uncover, uh, is to determine how we actually got to this point. What I will tell you, uh, I guess, to, to try to answer your question, is the president certainly feels a responsibility to ensure that government resources are mobilized to assist those who have been harmed. Uh, and that's why you've seen a significant commitment of resources on the part of the federal government. Everything from the delivery of bottled water and water filters to uh, stepped up uh, health care services. All of that, the president feels, uh, is a responsibility of the federal government. Uh, ultimately, it's state and local officials, though, who have to make some of the policy decisions to rectify the situation. Uh, there certainly are, are additional resources that can and should be appropriated by Congress so the federal government can support uh, the improvement and overhaul of the uh, infrastructure in, inside of Flint. So there certainly is an important role for the federal government to play to try to address uh, uh, this situation and try to assist those who have been harmed by it. Uh, but when it comes to uh, who exactly made a mistake and what are the mistakes they've made so we can avoid them other places, that's, uh, that continues to be under investigation. On the next subject, um, Judge Merritt uh, Garland, if you can give us a little bit of insight or as much insight as you can um, as to the conversations with him about the uphill battle. I mean, I know he knew going in that this was going to be an uphill battle. But could you talk about the conversations here at the White House about what would be needed to convince senators um, how he would have to put his elbow in this a little bit more and how you guys might help him? Could you talk to us about that? Well, uh, Chief Judge Garland has been around for a long time. And he has seen that questions about confirming a Supreme Court nominee are tough. This is supposed to be a, a rigorous process. Uh, there should be a debate. Uh, there should be hearings in which senators from both sides of the aisle are asking probing questions uh, of the nominee, inquiring about their record, uh, and inquiring about the way uh, they believe that a Supreme Court justice should do his or her job. Uh, the, and those are difficult, nuanced questions. Uh, but those are questions that should be asked, and those are questions that should be answered. And so Chief Judge Garland is not at all surprised uh, that when he uh, agreed to be the President's nominee, uh, that he was signing up for an arduous task. Uh, but the kind of responsibility that we give to someone who gets a lifetime appointment on the Supreme Court is significant. Uh, and that's why it's appropriate for, their, uh, for the Senate uh, to play uh, this important role of asking some pretty tough questions. Any advice from this White House to Garland to tell him how to handle this different process, um, the process that people are refusing to offer him? Did this White House offer him any advice? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I mean, look, this is, you know, all, all confirmation battles are tough, and it's supposed to be that way. Uh, I guess our point is Senate Republicans should go through the process. Right now, they're, they're saying, we're not going to do our job. We're not going to ask them tough questions. We're not even going to meet with them. Uh, that's uh, inappropriate, and that is, uh, uh, you know, indicates a, a willingness on the part of Republicans to put politics ahead of their constitutional duties. And I don't think that's something that most Americans are, uh, are willing to stand for. On the 
last question. I understand that there was a meeting today on the Hill. Uh, many uh, African American leaders um, support the president are still very angry about the fact that um, there was not an African American uh, named as the nominee for this position. Could you talk to us about the meeting? Who was there? What was it? Was it was it a terse meeting? What can you give us information about this meeting today? Well, April, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I, I can tell you that uh, Valerie Jarrett uh, did spend some time with members of the Congressional Black Caucus up on Capitol Hill. And everyone who attended that meeting uh, indicated their strong support for the President's nominee. Uh, and uh, that's not a surprise. We're seeing that from other leaders in the civil rights community. Um, there's a, there were some comments from uh, former Attorney General Eric Holder uh, that I would call to your attention. Uh, uh, Mr. Holder said, uh, he's a person, referring to Chief Judge Garland, I think, who has worked hard to keep communities safe, bring dangerous criminals to justice. He's also a person who showed compassion. He comes from humble beginnings. He's a person who left a pretty prestigious partnership here in Washington, D.C. to work in the U.S. Attorney's Office that I ultimately headed and got down here, worked with people in this community to make them and to keep them safe. Uh, that's why uh, Mr. Holder went on to say that he's a guy who I think is eminently qualified. Uh, and he observed, as I have on many occasions, that uh, no one has taken any shots at him. Uh, but Mr. Holder's not the only person. Uh, we saw uh, some comments uh, in a news release from Wade Henderson, uh, who leads the uh, Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, and he was pretty direct. He said Judge, Chief Judge Garland is the most well-prepared Supreme Court nominee in generations. And he went on to say that we will mobilize our massive network of civil rights advocates, legal scholars, and everyday people who care about democracy and our Constitution to make sure that the Senate does its job. Now, we obviously are pleased to see that Chief Judge Garland is getting such strong support from leaders in the civil rights community. He deserves it. So why then you had the meeting yesterday, the President had the meeting yesterday with the leaders right after he left the uh, Rose Garden and the Roosevelt Room, and then why have to go to Capitol Hill today to talk to the leaders? I mean, can you tell me why? Well, I mean, because they the- weren't angry, They weren't angry about this? Well, uh, I guess what I'm telling you is that that everybody that, uh, that Valerie met with today, uh, uh, that included a number of CBC members, uh, expressed their strong support for the President's decision to put forward uh, Chief Judge Garland. And they share the President's confidence that he would serve this country with honor and distinction on the Supreme Court. Uh, so we were obviously gratified by that response, but uh, that response is uh, uh, by no means unique. Uh, we're seeing that kind of strong support from a variety uh, of corners in the civil rights community. Uh, and that support is um, quite well justified. Okay. Kevin. Thanks, Josh. Just to follow up on what April is asking, was the meeting set up just to sort of bridge the gap in case there were any Bruce feelings based on the selection of uh, Chief Judge Garland? Well, I know that, uh, that Ms. Jarrett regularly interacts uh, with members of the Congressional Black Caucus. I, um, I, I don't know what else was on her agenda when she traveled up there to, to visit with them, but uh, obviously given the news and obviously given the significance of this decision and the significance of the Republican refusal to even consider this nomination, uh, this, was, uh, uh, this was something that was discussed extensively in the meeting. Let me also ask you about something uh, Senator Chuck Schumer said today. He said, in refusing to even give uh, Chief Judge Garland an up or down vote, Republicans are essentially saying that we would rather take our chances with a Trump nomination or with a Clinton nomination to the high court. What's your reaction to that? Well, I do think that it, um, it definitely leads Republicans, um, at least rhetorically, into a box canyon. They're suggesting that somehow uh, a President Trump, whom they vowed to run attack ads against to prevent him from being elected president, uh, or a President Hillary Clinton, whom they have made no bones about the fact that they do not support, would do a better job of appointing Supreme Court justices than President Obama, despite the fact that many Republicans currently serving in the Senate have twice supported President Obama's appointments to the Supreme Court, and despite the fact that President Obama, for, to fill this third vacancy, has put forward somebody that even Republicans themselves acknowledge is a consensus nominee. Their argument, to put it bluntly, makes no sense. And I haven't really heard anybody try to explain it, uh, but uh, I think, going back to Michelle's question, I think this is why you see some confidence in the White House today. 
we're, we're not seeing a coherent explanation on the part of Republicans for why they have taken such an unreasonable position to even consider the nomination of Chief, Chief Judge Garland. Uh, in fact, there's quite a strong argument uh, for why they should do so. But there are concerns about his positions on um, abortion, about his positions on the Second Amendment in particular, so you can understand that where there might be some, some hesitance among conservatives about his candidacy. Well, again, I, I, Judge, uh, Senator Hatch is certainly a conservative. Uh, I, I think he described himself that way, and I think most other people would describe him that way, too. Uh, and he described uh, 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 Chief Judge Garland as, uh, as a consensus nominee and somebody that he strongly supports. I, I, think, um, I think the other point, Kevin, though, is this is why we should have hearings. So if people want to raise these kinds of concerns and they want to ask uh, Chief Judge Garland about his writings on these topics, that's an entirely legitimate line of inquiry. That's exactly why we have hearings. And I'm not just suggesting that Republicans should be able to ask these questions. I'm suggesting that Chief Judge Garland should appear in public, on camera, under oath, and spend hours answering those questions. He has an obligation to do that. He's prepared to do that. And I think when he does, he will demonstrate the kind of wisdom and judgment and commitment to the law that we would expect from somebody who's going to be given uh, a responsibility as significant as serving on the Supreme Court. Last one, I want to follow up on uh, the, the conversations about Administrator McCarthy. Is it your feeling or is it the White House's feeling that she's done everything right in the circumstance as it relates to what has happened in Flint, Michigan? Well, I think in some ways for her performance, I'd, I'd ask you to ask her. Uh, she obviously is in a position to best assess uh, what decisions that she made. Uh, and if there are some things that she wishes she had done differently, then you should ask her about that. What I will tell you is that she has acted aggressively uh, to do two things. The first is uh, to make sure we're mobilizing the kind of scientific and technical advice that's needed to restore as quickly as possible uh, a clean water supply in Flint. The other thing that she has done is she has reached out to governors from coast to coast to be crystal clear about what exactly they need to do to enforce the lead and copper rule, to make sure that what happened uh, in Flint uh, doesn't happen again. And she has vowed uh, that if state and local officials who do have primary responsibility fail to fulfill their constitutional, or f fail to fulfill their responsibility, that the EPA will not hesitate uh, to step in and act uh, to protect the safety and well-being of the American people. But has the, the rule changed? I, because if I remember, at least the way it was ex described to me by you, was, well, the state has an obligation to sort of make a decision. The EPA gets information based on testing, and they might say, well, you've got an issue, but it's the state's call. I'm just wondering, has the process changed along with the rhetoric, which is now saying, hey, listen, we're committed to change. We're going to do things differently. Has there been something substantive that I'm unaware uh, of? I'm not aware if there's been a specific rule change that's been initiated. I think what the letter was intended to do, and I think it has done, it has removed any ambiguity uh, uh, within the rule about how it can and should be enforced and what the EPA will do if it's not. And I think you know, part of the problem here is that there was some ambiguity about that. Uh, but that ambiguity has been removed uh, because of the decisive uh, actions that are taken by Administrator McCarthy. Okay, Margaret. Josh, on that same topic, um, you said ask Administrator McCarthy, who actually testified today, mm -hmm. um, and said that the EPA should have done more to head off the crisis, but she repeatedly said she did not have the authority. So you said you're confident in her abilities now. Are you confident that now the EPA has the authority and the foresight um, in order to head off another crisis like this outside of Flint. Well, if she is asking a Congress for additional authority, then I hope they'll listen to her because she knows what she's talking about. And if that's what she's asking for, that's what she should get. Uh, what I'm saying is that in response to this crisis situation, she took decisive action to make sure that in Flint they had access to the scientific and technical advice they need to correct the problems in the water supply. And I understand that they've been working assiduously uh, to do that. but. Look, I think her concern that immediately popped to mind is not dissimilar from the kind of concerns I think popped into the minds of many of us, uh, which is that if it's happening in Flint, is it happening somewhere else? Right. And that's why she sent a letter to uh, governors all across the country and said, look, this is what we're going to do to make sure that uh, drinking supplies, water supplies uh, across the country are adequately tested uh, and 
Uh, if there are concerns about the safety of the water supply, these are the steps that uh, we can and should take. And to the extent that there is any ambiguity about the way that that rule should be enf enforced in the past, uh, you know, her letter removes that ambiguity. But as of, I understand she can ask for more authority and it's up to Congress, but as a federal agency, does this building have confidence that the EPA can protect all those other communities from this happening? Well, there are obviously steps that she can take, but look, I would, she can speak to this more effectively than anyone else. If she's saying that she needs more authority from the United States Congress to better protect the health and safety of the American people, then I don't understand why Congress wouldn't give it to her. But that's saying then that there is reason not to be confident. Well, I, I think uh, Kevin was asking me more a question about her performance as the EPA administrator. Right, but confidence now that you can prevent another Flint elsewhere in the country. Well, again, she has taken steps, and I'm confident that she is using all of the authority that she has. Uh, but she is in the best position to assess uh, whether or not she needs additional authority to assure all of us uh, that our clean, uh, that our drinking water remains clean. Uh, so, uh, again, I, I, I check with her. Can I ask you as well on? Uh, Genocide's a significant historical marker to put down there. I mean, President Clinton had Rwanda, President Bush had Sudan. <coughs> now, this administration, who has laid out atrocities prevention as a national security concern <coughs> and a priority, has genocide on its watch, an ongoing genocide. What is the administration's reaction to that? Because that goes in the history books. Yeah, and I think this is a reaction that you can measure dating back to the summer of 2014. Uh, where the president ordered military action against ISIL fighters that were targeting religious minorities only because of their religious views. But it didn't stop then, and many massacres continued well after that intervention in August. Yeah, yeah but what's also, what's also happened is you've seen 10, 000, more than 10,000 airstrikes be taken against ISIL targets. Uh, you have seen progress being made by local fighters on the ground, driving ISIL out of territory that they previously held. Uh, you've seen the president order special operations raids uh, against uh, high-value ISIL targets, some of whom were actually involved in hostage-taking and in victimizing uh, religious minorities. Uh, you've seen a coordinated effort to try to shut down ISIL's financing, some of which included uh, the uh, taking religious minorities hostage and selling them for ransom. Uh, you have seen uh, the administration work effectively with the international community to try to confront uh, ISIL's ability to radicalize and recruit individuals from around the world. So our response here has been robust. And there has never been an attempt on the part of the administration to try to downplay uh, the significance of these atrocities. We have taken them seriously from the beginning. And I think because of uh, how serious we think they are, that's why the president has ordered such a robust response. But what you're describing is part of the campaign to de degrade and destroy and ultimately defeat ISIL as a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. Historians, Holocaust Museum, which has been following us and documenting it, would also say, look, there was a different mission between stopping World War II and winning the war and preventing the mass extermination of Jews. And there was great regret that more wasn't done. You've had presidents following that recently, President Clinton saying, I wish I had done more in Rwanda. <coughs> given that and given the acknowledgement that these things are two different issues, ending a war, winning a war, <coughs> defeating a terrorist group, and stopping genocide, does the administration feel that it could be doing more, not just these air campaigns you talked about and those uh, choices here and there to intervene to stop mass atrocities when you can? Yeah. Well, again, I, I use those. Those are only two examples that I sought, both uh, that I cited, both uh, at Mount Sinjar and Amerli, because those are concrete examples of the United States military, not just using our military power, but also our moral authority to save individuals who are being targeted just because of their religious views. And look, I, I think there is an aspect of your question that I, um, uh, the premise of your question that I disagree with, at least a little bit, at least in part. Degrading and ultimately destroying ISIL is the best way for us to prevent them from carrying out these kinds of atrocities. It's not the only way, but is the, it is the most effective way for us to definitively ensure that these terrorists aren't terrorizing religious minorities just because of their religious views. What we've also acknowledged uh, is that there is, at the root of all of this, a political problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, and there is no denying uh, or downplaying the significance of political leaders speaking out uh, and setting the tone for a political climate that ensures that, the, that people aren't targeted uh, just because of their religious views, uh, that they're not marginalized, that they're not victimized. 
because of their religious views. Uh, and that certainly is part of uh, our effort to bring about a political transition inside of Syria. Uh, it's, a, it's to bring about a political leadership inside of Syria that will reflect the will and ambition of the Syrian people, but also make sure that Syria can be governed uh, in a way that represents the uh, diversity of its population. When you said there were significant legal implications when my colleague asked you about that the other day, what are the significant legal uh, implications if there are any for the military actions that are being carried out now? Are you going to target differently fighters who have you know, more than 3,000 sex slaves in their position, something an airstrike couldn't really prevent? Are you going to you know, do things to intervene on the ground to prevent incidents of mass rape or mass slaughter? I mean, they're, Tactically speaking, it's not something that airstrikes alone can do. Well, the, so what, yeah. what well, is the next step? Well, I, uh, so let me take apart these two things. I think I've tried to describe that uh, airstrikes are certainly the most visible uh, and in some ways um, among the most impactful aspects uh, of our campaign against ISIL. But there are a whole bunch of other things that we have done to degrade and ultimately destroy that organization. Uh, we have supported uh, fighters on the ground. Uh, we have sought to shut down their financing, uh, counter their ability to move foreign fighters into the country, uh, and counter their ability to try to radicalize people around the world to their cause. Um, we have supported uh, the uh, fledgling political government, uh, uh, political leadership inside of Iraq. Uh, Prime Minister Abadi has made important steps uh, in uh, unifying that country and governing that country in a way uh, that they can confront uh, this uh, uh, this extremist terrorist organization. Um, so there's a lot that we have done uh, to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL that does uh, make it harder uh, for ISIL uh, to carry out these kinds of abhorrent atrocities. Um, this is something that we take seriously. And, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this judgment from the State Department uh, reflects uh, just how serious the situation is. Just to button it up believe that the administration has succeeded in its mission to actively prevent atrocities? Well, there's no doubt that there are atrocities that have been prevented because of actions that this administration has taken and that this president has ordered. There's no denying that. Uh, but our work is not going to be done, and ISIL will continue to be a danger uh, to the region and to religious minorities in the region uh, as long as uh, they continue to exist. Uh, and that's why the president is determined to lead an international coalition to degrade and destroy them. Okay. Uh, Juliet. Let's go back briefly to the Austin fundraiser and the president's comments. In the New York Times account of his, of his remarks, it said that the president talked specifically about the issue of authenticity, that while Clinton might not come across to voters with the same level of authenticity, as Senator Sanders, that shouldn't be the only criteria under which voters judge Democratic candidates. Since you were there, could you illuminate a little of how accurate that is as a description of what the President conveyed to the group? Uh, I, I'm not going to get into the, uh, the President's private comments. I recognize that there are some people who have talked about those private comments, but uh, I'm not going to do that from here. Um, you know, the President has made a forceful case, uh, uh, frankly, about uh, the kind of campaign that Senator Sanders has run. Uh, and um, the President has noted that uh, Senator Sanders deserves a lot of credit for the passion that he has inspired among Democrats all across the country. Uh, and, and Senator Sanders uh, uh, is talking about deeply held views and doing it in a way that deeply resonates with people. Um, and that's a, a testament to his skills as a, as a leader and as a politician uh, and as somebody who's got his values in the right place. The President's also talked about uh, Secretary Clinton and her leadership abilities uh, and the way that she has drawn her own passionate following. The historic nature of her candidacy certainly has something to do with it, uh, but so does her track record uh, of fighting for the kinds of values and advancing the kinds of values uh, that Democrats have long championed. Uh, that's why the President feels especially fortunate uh, to be in a party that can actually be proud of its presidential candidates uh, and doesn't have to spend all its time trying to figure out a way to put distance between uh, uh, his party's candidates. Uh, we find that uh, Republican leaders in Washington, D.C. spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, and the truth is, they haven't done it enough uh, because even at those times when they do try to put uh, some distance between themselves and their leading uh, presidential candidate, uh, they continue to insist that they'll support him 
if he's their party's nominee for president. And for the life of me, I don't understand how they reconcile those views. Uh, and uh, I think there are a lot of Americans who are also scratching their heads when they hear those declarations, too. I'm not the only one. Okay. Anita. Um, I actually was going to ask about the same thing. You said you okay. won't comment, but the New York Times story says the White House confirmed it. Your response now indicates you're not confirming it, but you're not denying it either. If they're not true, what the president, what they're saying, the president said, what you just say, they're not true. Well, I'm doing my best to uh, to help you uh, uh, to help you cover this story, um, but uh, I'm not going to be in a position to uh, you know to walk through every uh, uh, statement as I remember it from uh, five days ago. Pool into every event, and we wouldn't have to yeah. ask. Good news, Nita. The pool was there for the beginning. Not for these comments. Uh, that's correct. But uh, allowing the pool, allowing the pool into uh, an event that is hosted in a private home, uh, represents an advance for transparency that the previous administration didn't respect. Okay, let me ask you another quick question. Yesterday, you mentioned a couple or a few of the Republican senators that I think were either meeting, or you can clarify this, or having agreeing to talk on the phone with Judge Garland. Are, are, can you tell us what the update is? Do you have a number of? Uh, Republican senators that have met with him or agreed to meet with him? Well, the, so there are two meetings that he's doing today. He's meeting with Senator Leahy, uh, I believe, at 2.30, and then Senator Reid at 4 o'clock today. Okay. Uh, he'll do those meetings up on Capitol Hill. Um, and uh, I don't know if there are additional meetings that have been scheduled at this point, but we'll try to keep you uh, uh, in the loop on that. Uh, uh, Chief Judge Garland did have an opportunity to ha make some phone calls yesterday. Uh, one of those phone calls was placed to Chairman Grassley. Uh, and uh, in conjunction with that phone call, there was a conversation between White House staff uh, and members of Chairman Grassley's staff about arranging a meeting, and uh, that's what we're working to do after the recess. Um, and look, I anticipate that there will be additional meetings, and uh, the comments that I cited yesterday uh, were just public comments from individual members of the Senate who are Republican, who to varying degrees indicated a willingness to have a conversation with Chief Judge Garland. So Senator Ayotte, Senator Collins, Senator Flake, Senator Portman, Senator Kirk, Senator Inhofe, Senator Grassley, and Senator Cochran, uh, what many of those people have in common is they actually voted for his confirmation to the uh, D.C. Circuit uh, Court of Appeals back in 1997. Uh, but uh, you know, we certainly will be in touch, if we haven't already, uh, with all these offices to, uh, to set up those meetings. Thanks, okay. Olivia, I'll give you the last one. Uh, and in keeping with tradition, I'm going to ask you two. Uh, okay. <laughs> following, following up on Mark's question about the dissident meeting in Cuba, um, are any of the dissidents that the President would like to meet with currently in government custody? Uh, I, I'll be honest, uh, Olivia, I haven't seen the list of people that the President is planning to meet with, but uh, we can have that discussion once we put out the list of, uh, of people that the President uh, is planning to meet with. And then following up on Darlene and Margaret, um, on the genocide question, mm -hmm. I, I guess the way I would phrase it is, can you identify an aspect of the American military campaign against the Islamic State? that will change as a result of this determination? Mm -hmm. Well, I was asked this question uh, quite a bit uh, in advance of the, term of, uh, you know, of the work that was being done at the, at the State Department on this. And I indicated that uh, even without uh, that State Department decision having been made, the President had ordered robust uh, military action. Uh, and uh, that's because we acknowledged, uh, even without a uh, formal announcement from the State Department, uh, that religious minorities in Iraq and in Syria were being targeted by ISIL. And that was an affront on all people of faith, uh, or an affront to all people of faith. And the President ordered action to, uh, to try to stop it. And uh, those actions uh, will continue unabated, and that uh, they would continue uh, whether or not there was an announcement and a pretty powerful speech from the Secretary of State today or not. That, that sounds like a no, but um, the, the, when you talk about cooperating with independent investigations on the ground, mm -hmm. I can envision uh, a, a scenario in which maybe that means uh, having American troops spend more time on the ground to collect evidence of atrocities than they currently are, building more of a case, um, supporting those efforts differently. Yeah. Um, but I'm not hearing you say that, so I, I'm trying to get at whether there's any concrete change here. And I, I, yeah. I've heard you say in response to a bunch of my colleagues, basically no. Um, but. Well, I, I don't know if there will be additional requests that are made of uh, U.S. military personnel uh, to uh, be involved in this effort. Uh, you can check with the Department of Defense about that. Uh, obviously, there are a bunch of resources that we can bring to bear uh, on this, and um, you know we will be supportive, of, strongly supportive, of an independent international effort uh, to uh, hold those accountable for um, 
carrying out atrocities uh, like we see in, uh, in Iraq and in Syria. Okay. George, this is St. Patrick's Day. I feel like uh, I, should not, uh, I should not pass over you today. So I'll give you the final one. Well, actually, it doesn't involve St. Patrick's Day. The, okay. Uh, uh, I'd like to get your reaction to two statements made since Jerry Adams was blocked from entering the White House mm -hmm. on Tuesday. Uh, Mr. Adams said that some in this administration treat Sinn Féin differently and suggest that they'd like to relegate Sinn Féin to the back of the bus. And then Congressman Brendan Boyle asked, is there something sinister going on at the White House other than the security? Uh, no. <laughs> there's, a, there's no policy decision uh, that, uh, that related to uh, the difficulty that Mr. Adams encountered at the uh, White House gate. Um, this is probably not different than difficulty that uh, all of you have encountered at the White House gate uh, on one occasion or another. Um, I think the Secret Service spoke to this uh, and indicated that uh, there was a mistake that they worked to rectify. Uh, but they weren't able to rectify it uh, 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 in sufficient time based on Mr. Adams' uh, judgment. Is but there uh, contact between the White House and, and Sinn Féin or Adams? Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know whether or not there's been a subsequent, subsequent converse, conversation to apologize. I saw that the, uh, the Secret Service, at least in one published report, did indicate that uh, they regretted what had happened, that it offered him an apology. Uh, I don't know if that was just a public statement or if they'd reached out to him uh, personally. But I can assure you there was no policy decision uh, to uh, in any way inhibit uh, his ability to participate in Tuesday's festivities. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks,